Hello, my name is Frank Taylor, Project Director of the Oral History of Criminology and Criminal Justice. I'm speaking to you today from Chicago, Illinois. The date is November 21st, 1996. Today, we're going to interview William Shambliss. Hello, uh, I'm Mark Ham from Indiana State University. It's my great pleasure to be here to uh, interview uh, William Chambliss from George Washington University and uh, as part of this series on pioneers in criminology. <clears throat> Let me start, uh, Bill, with the beginning. Uh, how did you uh, come to be involved in criminology? Now that's that take the whole hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I, w I left home basically when I was 15 and I was hitchhiking to Seattle mm -hmm. Uh, with the idea of getting to Alaska to work on the, in the fisheries or some industry mm -hmm. up there. And I went up with a friend whose name was Billy Hummel. Mm -hmm. And when we got to Seattle, there was a longshoreman strike. To try to cut the story short, I didn't mm -hmm. get up to Alaska, but I went to work at some pea farms as a migratory laborer. Mm -hmm. And on the farms were convicts who were trustees from Walla Walla State Penitentiary in mm -hmm. Washington. So I got to know a bunch of these guys and became really curious about the fact that they all planned to go back to crime when they got out, mm -hmm. that they were all more interested in me as a sex object than as a friend, although I didn't mm -hmm. learn that for the first three weeks I was working there, mm -hmm. and that there was an immense amount of racism. and The whites wouldn't talk to the blacks, and the blacks wouldn't talk to the whites, and mm -hmm. I was talking to both groups, and the uh, whites essentially said, look, if you don't stop talking to the blacks, we're not going to talk to you anymore. Mm -hmm. and I said, okay, then I, did, then I just talked to the blacks. So th I just got interested in the, for the first time in mm -hmm. the, the whole thing of crime. Mm -hmm. And then when I went back to high school to finish my senior year, uh -huh. uh, I did papers on penology. Yeah. And then when I went to the university, I wanted to study crime. But I studied psychology thinking that was the way to do criminology uh -huh. Uh -huh. until I met Don Cressy at UCLA. And he said, no, no, no. He said, psychologists don't know anything. Sociology is what does criminology. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and as I took his courses, I became convinced he was absolutely right. Uh -huh. <laughs> psychology doesn't do anything. Uh -huh. And sociology uh -huh. does criminology. Great. And um, that was how. Uh, the second question is uh, along the lines of your personal life. Uh, is there anything in your personal life in those early years that uh, may have uh, forced you out there into those labor camps, into those uh, migratory camps and... Uh, yeah, started. well, you know, we, I, the family was quite poor. Yeah. Um, it was kind of a paradox. My mother was very middle class in uh -huh. her values and in her uh, customs and manners and things, but uh -huh. we didn't have any money. So when I worked in those places and associated with those people, I think that that gave me a, an entree to that kind of life mm -hmm. that I was comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So when I got a job at the University of Washington and decided I wanted to study how police make arrests, which is how my study of mm -hmm. organized crime started, it was easy for me to go down to those areas of the city yeah. because I had lived there <laughs> yeah. and I had worked there and I knew those people and mm -hmm. they, weren't, uh, mm -hmm. they weren't threatening to me and I was comfortable with them and I, I felt like one of them. I actually, I felt more like one of them than I did <laughs> my colleagues at the university for mm -hmm. a long time. So that made the whole process uh, easy. It also made me want to do that. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to be out there on the street. I wanted to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. I wasn't that interested in the more academic side mm -hmm. of uh, studying crime. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, in that way, it was very mm -hmm. parallel. I could deal with the same people. Mm -hmm. And I had seen a lot of it. I mean, I'd seen a lot of crime. I'd yeah. seen a lot of, uh, of uh, violence. I'd seen a lot of mean streets. Sure. And I'd also seen a lot of kindness in those mean streets yeah. and a lot of caring in yeah. those mean streets. So it was wanting to somehow keep that connection, I think, mm -hmm. with what my life had been like growing up mm -hmm. as well as making it part of my work as mm -hmm. I grew old. This know. no doubt is the basis of the interest in vagrants and yeah. vagrancy laws, right. no doubt. Exactly, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. that, you know, cause, because I had seen a lot of people picked up for yeah. what was and I'm talking long before I was a criminologist, yeah. just picked up for no reason. Kids, friends, you know, mm -hmm. picked up by the police. And uh, those vagrancy was often the kind of charge mm -hmm. they were picked up on. Mm -hmm. And I myself, when I was hitchhiking, when I left home, I hitchhiked across country from uh -huh. California to Virginia and uh, was arrested for vagrancy <laughs> because I didn't have mm -hmm. enough money and I spent the night in jail. 
And uh, it was kind of funny because the next mm -hmm. morning I went before the judge and the judge says, what are you in here for? And I said, uh, vagrancy. And he mm -hmm. said, I didn't know that was a crime. Get out of here. <laughs> 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 it was in a little town in Montana. Where uh -huh. they picked me up. So that kind of <laughs> was a connection with that as well. Uh -huh. But I also was always interested in historical research. And so the vagrancy was actually done for a course in labor law that I was taking when I was minoring in law mm -hmm. while I was at Indiana. Mm -hmm. And I had to do a paper, so I did a paper on the history of vagrancy laws for that uh -huh. class in the law school. Uh -huh. And then that That's became the paper on vagrancy. vagrancy <laughs> which was a, a classic and reprinted many times. Let's talk a little bit about Indiana and Alfred Linda Smith, a, a, a favorite of yours. and a, a, a my, my recollection of Linda Smith was that he was a compassionate man one interested in uh, trying to do what he could uh, to struggle for justice for heroin addicts. Uh, was that your, is that kind of your oh, recollection? Lindy is Lindy's one Smith. of my all-time heroes. Yeah. He was what you would really call a beautiful man. Yeah. I kind of interestingly equate him with Harry King, the professional thief I did yes. <laughs> work with. Uh -huh. uh, both very beautiful people. Yeah. And that's kind of a nice irony because Lindy, mm -hmm. I think, is father was a minister, but certainly oh. Lindy had a very strong Christian background. Right. And he was a gentle giant. He yeah. was beautiful and, and fun to be with. I, mm -hmm. I have to tell, when I was a graduate student, mm -hmm. uh, he was president of Triple SP one year. And he came up to me in the hall and he said, are you going to the Triple SP meeting? And I said, yes. And he said, would you like to share my room? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, yes. Well, the mm -hmm. president of Triple SP mm -hmm. asking a graduate student to yeah. share his room. Yeah. So we shared a room. Uh -huh. And uh, then he gave his talk and everything. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, it was just his way. He yeah. never, yeah. never thought about it. Yeah. You know, he did, looked around, I'm sure, and said, well, who needs a room if they're going? Who can't afford it? Mm -hmm. Instead of asking a colleague or a friend, he asked a poor graduate student. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. He was a fantastic man. He, he was a, a critical criminologist long before that term was used, Absolutely. wouldn't you say? Yeah, it, uh, yeah. Although he was basically a social psychologist in yeah. the way he did his work. So mm -hmm. he didn't ask the structural questions, uh -huh. which I think is unfortunate because with all of the, he had fights, as you know, with the Federal Narcotics Bureau at the time, and Henry, Harry Anslinger was right. trying to make, get him fired from the university, and he was trying to keep his books from being published. And I think if he had had a more structural approach, been more critical in what we think of as critical criminology hmm. today, that he in fact would have done better and more work on the law enforcement process that was inhibiting what he saw as necessary changes as a social psychologist. Very interesting. Very uh, went too quick to the medical explanation. Yeah. Uh, as he always perceived it, narcotic addiction was a medical problem, not a law enforcement problem. Right. That's exactly right. Uh -huh. And in, in fact, of course, that's true. But he had to see the law enforcement process as something that had to be intervened yes. in order to be, become a medical problem. Uh, yes. He understood that, but I don't think he did the structural analysis that uh -huh. he would have done if he had lived 20 uh -huh. years later. Methodologically, was there anything that Linda Smith passed on to you? It's oh, obviously a, a set-up <laughs> question set up, yeah, but in, in terms of continuing, as you did throughout all of your research, continuing to make contact with our subjects of study as people and not forgetting the fact that they are people. Yeah. Is, is, oh, would you certainly. say that that's that was another? Yeah, Lindy was a big inspiration there. But, you know, in another way, in a way that most people don't know about, he was an inspiration in that he always taught the philosophy of science. Uh -huh. So his courses always had a huge segment of how do we know, epistemological, but more than that, how does science develop? How do we create what he liked to call reliable knowledge? Right. And uh, that was extremely influential and led me, in fact, to take a lot of courses in the philosophy of science at Indiana, mm -hmm. as well as to continue reading afterwards in mm -hmm. that area. And that was very influential, I think. Mm -hmm. But mostly it was just the way he went about trying to figure things out. You know, he was... He was a curious man. Mm -hmm. He wanted to figure things out. Mm -hmm. He had a tremendous sense of humor. Mm -hmm. He would always tell jokes and mm -hmm. things. And it was just very kind. Mm -hmm. His door was always open. You could go. And I wouldn't have gone to Indiana if it hadn't been for him. Could you talk a little bit, some of your uh, colleagues, of the cohort students? Uh, you oh, we, we had a wonderful group. Yeah. Roland Shilton, oh, uh -huh. Joe Scott, who's done a lot of work in race relations. Right. Herb Costner, mm -hmm. who was really my mentor for methods and statistics, oh, a uh -huh. brilliant ma methodologist, wonderful mm -hmm. guy. And these were really fine people. Cherry Carter, mm -hmm. and Nancy, and I can't remember her last name because she mm -hmm. got married. <laughs> mm -hmm. But really a fantastic group of mm -hmm. students at the time that I was there. Ed Vaz was there when I was there. Right. 
and we had, we had it was quite cohesive, mm -hmm. a lot of fun as well as hard work, and mm -hmm. a little competition, but not a whole lot of competition. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't have the feeling you were fighting sure. to be at the top or the bottom or anything. You just yeah. were there studying together. It was a great time, wonderful time at Indiana. <coughs> so uh, from there, uh, it was 1962. Two, yeah. uh, that you left for Seattle. Right. Uh, right. Uh, then, <clears throat> then began your long series of, uh, of studies that would eventuate in a, a long uh, list of publications uh, uh, ranging from the uh, law of vacancy uh, and a number of, uh, of other theoretical contributions. And what was it? Uh, th this was the year when you're uh, posing as a truck driver. Is this right? And yeah, that's right. Going down to Skid Row. Yeah. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit but about it? But I was interested in. I didn't have any idea of studying organized crime mm -hmm. or anything like that, but I, some work was being done on policing and how police made decisions to make arrests. Mm -hmm. Most of it was being done by people riding around in police cars. And I thought that was giving a distorted view because mm -hmm. I didn't think the police were actually going to behave the same way with a sociologist in the car as they would when they were not being observed. So I started to go down to where most of the arrests were made, and in every city most of the arrests were made in the very small area of the city, mm -hmm. Burgess's concentric zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went down there dressed as a truck driver, which mm -hmm. I had been a truck driver when I was going to college, so I mm -hmm. felt comfortable. And I went down in khakis, and, and uh, I shaved my beard. Mm -hmm. But I would go down with a couple of days growth, so I looked like I was sure. kind of. And I just started watching how the police behaved and quite by accident discovered uh, a bag man from the police department coming in to pick up his money in one of these places that was, I thought, just a restaurant where I used to go, and had gotten friendly with a waitress who was an ex-heroin addict and an ex-prostitute. And then I said, you know, why is he coming in here with, and then she said, well, he's the bag man. I mean, it was like, mm. it was like asking for a donut. She says, we only <laughs> have chocolate. <laughs> she said, well, he's the bag man. I said, yeah, yeah. oh, well, from uh, uh, the police. Mm. She said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, why do you have to pay him off? And they uh -huh. said, well, because of the gambling room in the back. And I oh. said, oh, I said, well, can I go in there? And she uh -huh. said, well, sure. <laughs> Just uh <-huh>. watch your wallet. <laughs> so uh -huh. then I got into it. And that's yeah. how I discovered that there was, in fact, this huge industry mm -hmm. in gambling, and then, of course, I got into the drugs and prostitution and, mm -hmm. and uh, high interest loans and all the other kinds of things that were organized around illegal activities in mm -hmm. the city. And after about six months of that, I had reached a kind of plateau. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't seem to be getting any further. I'd gotten quite a bit of information, but I wasn't able to break into the higher echelons. Mm -hmm. I knew pretty much how it worked on the low level of the gambling and the drugs and the prostitution mm -hmm. and where, how they were distributed, where the drugs were hidden and things of that type. But I couldn't get much further. And so I decided, well, you know, I might as well come clean with some of these people and see what will happen because this isn't doing me much good. So I uh, called up one of my informants mm -hmm. and I said, uh, I'd like to take you to lunch tomorrow. And he said, uh, sure, where should we meet? We'd had lunch together downtown. I mm -hmm. said, well, come to the university and meet me at my office. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, just come, because uh -huh. we'd become friends, and uh -huh. he trusted me. So he came out, and then uh -huh. he came to my office, and I said, you know, I hope you don't mind the deception, but I, uh -huh. I feel bad about the deception, uh, but I didn't think there was any way that I could find out and yeah. participate and yeah. if I had just said, he said, well, he said, you know, I didn't know. He said, I, I could tell you lots of things. Mm -hmm. And he, so what I had been getting just by questioning without acting like I was trying to get information uh, was quite a bit of information, mostly inadvertently revealed by these people. But the strange thing was, I thought that this probably would blow the research, that mm -hmm. that was going to be the end of it and mm -hmm. I wouldn't get any further. What was really strange was that once I told this guy and mm -hmm. then other people, look, I'm a professor at the university and I'm interested in setting organized crime you know you can trust me, it's totally confidential, I will never reveal anything I find out in any way that could hurt anybody I'm connected with. Um, and you can be sure that's true because I've had this information for six months and obviously I haven't. Then I started getting phone calls from people I didn't know saying, I understand, you. and some, some were kind of like, I understand you're interested in organized crime. <laughs> you kind of shake on the other end of the phone, try to be cool, say yes, yes, I have an academic interest in. So, 
they get phone calls of guys saying, listen, uh -huh. you know, why don't you come and have a drink with me, or, uh -huh. you know, I'm going to be at such such a place, or, you know, you might want to check out this bank president that has and suddenly I started getting all kinds of information, some of it just like that. Yeah. Well, did you know that Bill so-and-so yeah. was really the guy behind the, the police department who's doing all of the collections, and did you know? And, and then, of course, the problem is validity. I mean, that's what you have to worry most about. So I just developed a, a strategy of not believing anything I was told mm -hmm. until I had confirming evidence. Mm -hmm. So. Now, you know, this is always as questionable as mm. to what, what you accept as confirming evidence mm. and the like. But, for example, when they said, well, now, there's this group of guys who meet every week at this restaurant, and they meet to discuss the payoffs and the splits and how the gambling enterprises that they have something to do with are doing. And they're always there at the same place. Mm -hmm. And you can go there and see them. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And I sat near them, and I could hear the conversation was, in fact, exactly what these people had said. And the seven people were exactly the seven people they had named. And to find that out, I had to follow them almost, because I didn't know them by faith. But, mm -hmm. you know, there was a vice president of a bank and so forth, and police. Mm -hmm. So that way, I tried to be sure that whatever I was told was true. Yeah. But then a number of things happened, because once they discovered that I was doing this, not uh -huh. the people I was working with, but uh -huh. the people I was getting information on, then they decided to try to find out what I knew, uh -huh. first of all. So they bugged my telephone. Uh -huh. And then they tried to intimidate me. I don't think in, initially they were very worried about me. Uh -huh. Because they, I think, and I have some evidence actually, they heard from the people on the street that I wouldn't inform and I wasn't going to blow up. I wasn't a reporter. That was the most thing they were concerned about. Nor was I an FBI agent. You know, I, they were clear I was a professor. Right? And that helped immensely. That title, Professor, boy, is magic. <laughs> it mm -hmm. works in banks to get loans and yeah. work here. To <laughs> so um, they try to do things so that they would have something on me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they wanted to reveal it. They just wanted to have it in case I got out of line at first. Then later, I think it changed. So they tried to set me up with prostitutes so that I would go for the mm -hmm. prostitute. And, uh, there were some really funny scenes where women were trying to pick me up in bars, really beautiful women trying to pick mm -hmm. me up in bars. And fortunately, I had never had that experience in my life, so I knew something <laughs> funny was going on. <laughs> it wasn't exactly the <laughs> handsomest, most charming man on the street. I didn't think they'd pick me. So I, uh, they tried to do some things like that to try to keep me. But mostly, it, the whole avenues just opened up widely police people, police, and corrupt ones, you know, mm -hmm. not just the ones who were uh, honest and trying to break open what was going mm -hmm. on. And then I did also get help from reporters who had mm -hmm. not ever tried to look at the whole picture, which is what I was trying to get at, mm -hmm. but had looked at pieces of it. And so I could in sometimes call reporters who were friends of mine and say, I've heard such and such a story. Have you ever heard that story? And I'd, one of the strategies I developed was to give misinformation. So I would say, I've heard that, say, Bill Carroll is the man who is mostly responsible for bringing heroin into the city. And that wasn't what I'd heard. You know, what I'd heard was that it was Tony mm. Javaro. And then they would say, oh, that you've got, you, you're really being misled. Bill Carroll has nothing to do with it. It's Tony Javaro. Mm -hmm. So this would be a way of confirming what awesome. I said. Yeah. The other thing I found was that, two other things, was that you had to have some information when you talked to these guys. If you mm -hmm. went in cold and said, now I know nothing about organized crime in the city mm -hmm. and I wish you'd tell me, they just wouldn't tell you anything or they'd give you a cock and roll story. Kind of like you get from your dean if you ask the dean <laughs> that kind of question. <laughs> so what they did do though was I would say, uh, things like I just gave mm -hmm. an example of, I would say, now I figure that this gambling business in Seattle is so big, it must generate $300 million a year. Huh. No way can't be over a hundred. <laughs> so, I mean, you mm -hmm. get that kind of information and, and actually mm -hmm. the figure that I was guesstimating was a hundred million dollars a year. And uh, then you kind of get their impression. Of course, mm -hmm. no one's keeping books and mm -hmm. there are a lot of different people involved in all of these different enterprises. So, no one could keep books even mm -hmm. if they wanted to. So, we're all kind of guessing. Mm -hmm. But you get people who are up there enough so that they probably have a pretty good idea of what's going on. That uh, honesty and that courageous sort of uh, approach, gaining access, of course, uh, also led you to do uh, 
a, a classic piece of uh, research on uh, street gangs and, and inspired many of us uh, into this field, myself included. And I'm, of course, talking about the Saints and the Roughnecks. Do you want to, uh, would you talk just a bit, you gave a marvelous lecture one time about simply meeting these kids in front of a pizza parlor, uh, <laughs> parlor someplace, <laughs> I believe. Cafe, that, yeah. Ca yeah. Uh, oh, it was great. I mean, that was just uh, serendipity. Uh -huh. It plays such a big part in these things. For me, it has anyway. I mean, I'd, I mean, almost everything I've done has mm -hmm. been just because I got interested in something and then I thought, well, I'll try to explore it. And then something else grew out of it. I was intending to go to a school mm -hmm. and give a questionnaire because I was interested in whether or not the self-image of people was different if they engage in delinquency or not. You know, the classic kind of question that we were asking in the 60s and late 50s. And uh, so I went to the school armed with my questionnaires, but I thought, before I do that, I think I'm just going to hang around the school for a while. So I hung around the school, and people looked at me like I was a pervert. But yeah. I, it was, you know, I had a, I had a, cleared it with the school beforehand. Yeah. So then I noticed these guys leaving school all the time. It's a long story, but uh -huh. I'll just try to cut it short. And so I followed them, uh -huh. and they went to this cafe, and then they went to a pool hall, and that's where I made the entree because I could shoot pool pretty well. So one day they were shooting pool, and one of them wasn't shooting pool, and I said, "Would you like to shoot a game?" He thought you know, the kids all thought, "Think you're trying to pick them up or something." Uh -huh. And I said, you know, I just like to shoot. And he said, I don't have money. I said, I'll pay for it. So we uh -huh. shot. And I just started talking to him. He said, uh -huh. you know, I'm a sociologist. And I think he thought I might, yeah, I was a socialist or something. He didn't know I was a sociologist or anything. And uh, I would like to do a study. And the kids uh -huh. said, uh, well, he said, talk to my friends. And I talked to them. And they said, well, that's OK. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, what I'd really like to do is when you go places, if you'd give me a call, I'd just like to. Yeah. follow you. I don't, I don't want to be in your gang. I don't, I don't want to be part of it that way. I just yeah. want to be near you. Yeah. And they said, okay. And I, I really felt, I at first a few times, I think they were a little awkward, but I really felt that I, I was just like a bush or a tree for them. I, I just part of the scenery. It wasn't a while they'd play a trick on me, you know, they, mm -hmm. to let me know they knew I was there, <laughs> I guess. And just because they paid tricks on everybody. Mm -hmm. And then they suggested, one of them suggested, well, if you're interested in young people, you should see the guys that hang out down at the drugstore. And that was the rough thing. Yeah. And then basically the same thing happened. Yeah. There, I, my entree was a little bit more uh, uh, buying the meals at first, you know, if they were in the drugstore. It was a drugstore that had a counter for uh -huh. eating. Uh -huh. And I'd go in and uh, uh -huh. I'd, I'd see one of them and I'd say, it was like a hamburger or something. Uh -huh. Again, they were kind of suspicious. Why would this guy order? But it was a it was a time and a place where people weren't as suspicious as they are today. Yeah, uh, that method would uh, maybe have some problems uh, being used today, huh? With street I gangs, think so. uh, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, but no doubt, it did lead to what, as far as I can tell, the first longitudinal study of street gangs. Because then, you, two years later, you followed them no, up. No, I'm is still that, following them. Still, in fact, still following yeah. this this yeah. this yeah. long. In fact, I'm in the process of writing a book that will have a revision of that article, uh -huh. which will also include the method of how I did it. But it will be, have an inclusion, a conclusion of the article as to the people I've been able to keep contact with. And I've keep, kept contact with several of them from uh -huh. both of the gang, but I've lost contact with some too. Uh -huh. So it's not, unfortunately, going to be uh -huh. as complete as I'd like it to be, because yeah. I'd like to know exactly what I, but I have good information on what's happened to a number of them. Fascinating. We, <coughs> we haven't even gotten to the first book. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> books. <laughs> I guess we better move here. Uh, uh, let me skip to the second book, of course, the classic Law, Order, Law, Order, and Power, oh, which yeah. was published in 1971. Now, uh, during the, the time you're writing this book, the late 70s, 60s, excuse me, you've uh, accepted a position at Santa Barbara alongside Donald Cressy, who'd moved there at this time. Uh, can you talk a bit about... Um, the the work law order and power uh, the uniqueness of that work and set it in the context of the late '60s uh, <coughs> Southern California what was going through your <laughs> mind at all this time but actually <coughs> this took this began in Seattle uh -huh. and I I had come to the conclusion well I went to law school partly because I always thought we've got to understand the law mm -hmm. if we're going to understand crime. And this was Linda Smith's ta yeah. attack, and this was Cressy's attack, and this was also Sutherland's attack. And Jerome Hall was in the law school, so I worked a lot with Jerome Hall, who was a marvelous scholar, I mean, just an incredible mind. And so I always wanted to do law and crime and mm -hmm. criminology. So I set a seminar up at the, at the University of Washington with Pierre Vandenberg, who is a macro sociologist, anthropologist, historian, brilliant guy, and a uh, guy from, two people from anthropology and one from philosophy, all of whom were interested in the law. 
So we met once a week and talked about law. Mm -hmm. And that's actually why I went to Africa, too, because those conversations led me to believe I really had to have a comparative experience in law and in crime if I was going to really mm -hmm. understand what was going on. And so uh, when I left w Washington, I went to Wisconsin for a year as a Russell mm -hmm. Sage resident in law and sociology. Mm -hmm. And I took courses in African law from Bob Seidman. Mm -hmm. And we became friends. Mm -hmm. And I just said one day, a publisher came to me and said, we really need a text in law, sociology of law. Would you like to write one? And I knew I couldn't do it by myself. And I said, Bob, would you like to write a text? He said, yes, just like that. I mean, it was <laughs> not any hesitation. Uh -huh. I just said, and so we started working on it. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the finest experiences of my life. First, because, you know, this is one of the world's most wonderful, brilliant men as well. I mean, his, mm -hmm. his grasp of things is incredible. Mm -hmm. But he knew no sociology, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know that he'd like me to say that. But at the mm -hmm. time, he, he, uh, he, would, he was a very, very good lawyer, and he applied sociology in the way he did law. Mm -hmm. But he didn't really know the field of sociology. But he learned it, of course, of writing the book, and I learned a lot of law. And we just worked so well together. I mean, we'd mm -hmm. scream at each other. I mean, we would mm -hmm. spend, I mean, we <laughs> he came to the house a couple times, or I went to his house, and we would spend a couple weeks together working on parts of the book. And we would argue until two in the morning about some point, and he'd come in my bedroom in the morning and say, you're wrong about that, yeah. and he'd start right off. <laughs> but eventually we ironed these things out in such a wonderful, egalitarian, intellectual way where we really, and there were a couple of things I think, I don't even remember if it's true, but I suspect there were some things that I wrote that he didn't agree with. I don't remember anything he wrote I didn't agree with, but there probably were a couple of things he finally let slide because I was too stubborn to give up <laughs> on. <laughs> and he was probably right, too. <laughs> I should have given up on it. First page of that book, if I remember correctly, you, you uh, in a sort of hard-headed, it's a hard-hitting way, describe politicians as clowns. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I feel the right. same way. Yeah, well, <laughs> Have you changed your mind over the well, years? I, think I probably would use more <laughs> derogatory <laughs> terms today than I did then. Corrupt clowns. Would be more. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I think in many ways that book was kind of prophetic because mm -hmm. I think that the kind of picture it paints about the law and especially about the politics of law is, was, if anything, too conservative. And I think we've come to see that that's true. I mean, mm -hmm. I know we have a section in there about campaign financing. And at the time, no one was paying attention to campaign financing. And people said, you know, this is crazy. This has nothing to do with anything. And now we know, of course, it has a lot to do with everything. Yeah. And we know how corrupt it is. Yeah. So I think uh, if I were ever to revise it, it would probably have to be much, much more radical than it was. And you know, at the time, it was seen as a rather <laughs> radical <laughs> statement about law. It was amazing that it uh, uh, was published a year before Watergate. Yeah, that's right. That's true. I hadn't <laughs> thought of that. <clears throat> um, let me move uh, uh, rather quickly to um, the uh, uh, work with uh, uh, the Boxman and, and Harry King. You want right. to tell us how well, you came to meet? Uh, I met him through my work on organized crime. Uh -huh. and. Uh, he didn't know I was doing work on organized crime, mm -hmm. but I had just met him on the street. It, say, in Seattle? In Seattle, in Seattle. Yeah. yeah. He was he was a Seattle resident, uh -huh. and he had actually lived in Portland and Seattle all of his uh -huh. life. And in fact, the interesting story is the, that uh, one of my students used the book Boxman in his class teaching at Oregon State, uh -huh. and a student came up afterward and said, that's my father. Oh. And Harry was his father, and he said he was a bum. He was terrible. So Harry left when the kid was still yeah. a baby. Yeah. And uh, he should have been in prison for the rest of his life. And this book makes him sound like a decent person. He wasn't. <laughs> and the guy was a cop. <laughs> so <laughs> Harry's son became a cop. <laughs> but he never knew Harry. He never uh -huh. met him. He never had yeah. any idea what he was like. And it just wasn't true. He was a really wonderful guy. But I then realized, then he told me, you know, what, he'd mm. been a thief. And we talked about mm. being a thief and everything. And I then never asked him a question about organized crime mm -hmm. because I didn't want him in any way he wasn't part of organized crime, so if he had talked to me about it, he could have exposed himself to danger. So I never even told him I was doing a study of organized crime, right. and we never talked. He never was an informant on that for me, precisely because I wanted to protect him. So then when I wrote the first article on organized crime and gave it to him, he said, well, why didn't you tell me? I know a lot about that. I know these guys. You know? But I, uh -huh. I told him, I said, you know, I didn't want in any way to put you in any kind of jeopardy with the police, because they could always bust him. Yeah. And put him in his prison if they thought he was one of my major informants. 
And they were smart enough to know who was my informant. You know, uh -huh. they didn't have any question that Harry wasn't one of my informants. And he did he did get busted during the time that I was interviewing him. Yeah. They let him go right away. Oh, uh huh. So, uh -huh. and they wouldn't have if I don't think if they thought he was important to me as a link to organized uh -huh. crime information. So I kept that completely separate, and uh -huh. we worked on it for five years, and gathered information, and I had a stack of interview data uh, typed out like this. We didn't have computers in those days. <laughs> stack of information mm -hmm. like this and I mm -hmm. struggled like hell with it because it was mm -hmm. very tough to how do you how mm -hmm. do you put a how do you put a man's life <laughs> into a couple hundred pages when you've got fifteen hundred pages of document yeah. from interviews. Yeah. I left him a tape recorder so in addition to the interviews and when I would take notes we would tape things mm -hmm. and then I left him one so that he could always wake up at night and talk into it. So he would make oh. tapes and give them to me in addition to our interviews oh. and I mean, I would guess hundreds of hundreds, hours. Hundreds. hundreds. Were hundreds. you at all influenced uh, by Sutherland's The Professional Thief? Oh, yeah. I, I, in in fact, I had Harry read that. Oh, uh huh. And then, uh, not right away, but as we went yeah. on, I had him read The Professional Thief and asked him, you know, what he thought. Mm -hmm. He had comments to make about mm -hmm. it. And, and I think that helped him to see what mm -hmm. the product would ultimately be. Did you see any uh, striking differences between Chick, Chick Con Conway, Conway and, and Harry King? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, that's a good question. I think that, I think Harry was much more of a thief. Uh, uh -huh. Chick was a con man, yeah. you know, and yeah. he was more a part of the middle class. Mm -hmm. Harry was definitely a thief, definitely part of the thief's culture. I mean, this was his life. Uh -huh. Not 90% of the time, of course, he wasn't committing crimes, yeah. but his whole life was that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The way he lived, the way he bought and sold houses, the way he had relationships, who he had relationships with, yeah. where he stayed in hotels, everything was the fact that he was a thief. I am a thief, he said to himself. You know, yeah. He identified with it. Yeah. He liked thieves. He yeah. liked the people in that community. Yeah. Uh, he liked being with them. So I, I always had the feeling Chick was kind of a con man, but he wasn't really part of the thief's world. Mm -hmm. you know, he was uh, a, an accomplished con man who mm -hmm. might just as well have been a banker. Mm -hmm. But Harry couldn't have been a banker. You know, he had a third grade education and he yeah. was a thief. These are such... Uh, Classics, both the professional thief and box man, Thank you. And, and, and but of course they use the case study approach of one mm -hmm. person. Now that's all together disappeared, hasn't it? The, the case <laughs> study of one professional yes. thief, and now we have more aggregate studies of uh, of uh, property crimes and those sort mm -hmm. of things. <coughs> Why do you think that disappeared? Uh, well, it comes and goes, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Sutherland did his, but nobody did anything. I don't think until I did box uh -huh. man, and then a couple of others came out. Mm -hmm. Jackson did one. And, and uh, then, this, well, one of the reasons, I think, Mark, is because you don't just run into these guys yeah. every day. Yeah. And if you do, I mean, frankly, most of them aren't that interesting. Yeah. They don't have insights. They don't have self-analysis. Self yeah. And I mean, I met a lot of professional thieves yeah. in the course of the work, but most of them I wouldn't have written a book about. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't even have written an article yeah. about. Because yeah. they, don't, they don't have enough information. They don't, they don't yeah. see their world in yeah. a perceptive enough way to make it worthwhile. So if you think about the likelihood of meeting someone like that, pretty yeah. pretty slim. Yeah. And I suspect you know that somewhere you probably will mm -hmm. run across somebody, yeah. and a Maria Leto, and you'll uh, write a book about him or her. Yeah. Because yeah, uh, you'll find out this person really is going to give us some insights mm -hmm. that are going to be important. Mm -hmm. And that's of course what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You're not just looking for any old person who comes along and says, mm -hmm. "Yeah, I'm a thief. Write a book about me." <laughs> you know. As I read your biography that I've put together. It, it seems to me that 1975 was a turning point. It seems this, this the time in Oslo, in the cabin, I mean, just the opening pages uh -huh. to, um, uh, to On the Take indicate a period perhaps of somewhat isolation, time to get away, to, to rethink all of the, the mountains of data you've gathered in Seattle. A am I correct in that? Is, is, yeah, is and this it's also a personal crisis time. I'm uh -huh. in the middle of a divorce, and I've yeah. gone to... Uh -huh. And I've become completely alienated from America. Oh. The Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement. Oh. Uh -huh. I was just, I was just so disgusted that I decided I'm leaving. And I quit my job at UC Santa Barbara without any other job. Oh. And just went to uh, Oslo, oh, Norway. I, I had a three-month appointment there, I think, when oh. I went. Uh -huh. Turned into two years in Oslo and in Stockholm. Um, so it was a personal crisis in my life in uh -huh. terms of what I wanted to do with my life. Uh -huh. uh, and no question I wanted to go on writing, no question I wanted to go on doing research in this area, but 
how and exactly what. And so I also wanted a more comparative experience again, as I'd been to Africa to get a comparative experience right. in 1969. So I wanted a more comparative experience. And you're right. I mean, that year in the cabin mm -hmm. was a year of writing and reflecting where am I going? Where have I been? Like uh, Carl Sandburg said, you yeah. take a sandwich out in the woods and you ask yourself, where have I been? Where am I going? Mm -hmm. And who am I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I discovered the answer to any of those things, uh -huh. but I at least asked the question. Did you find any healing in the uh, writing of uh, uh, On the Take? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I always find healing in writing. Yeah. So whenever, yeah. to me writing is, uh, writing is my soul. Uh, yeah. And when I write, I feel good, mm -hmm. and it doesn't, I mean, the world around me might be in, mm -hmm. <laughs> in crumbles, yeah. but when I'm sitting there writing and I, the words are coming yeah. and I feel good about what I'm doing, then I really feel like I have been given a blessing. Yeah. To be able to mm -hmm. make a living doing what I do is yeah. unbelievable, <laughs> and I love it. So mm -hmm. it's always healing. I think I needed more healing then than I do at other times, yeah. probably, so it was yeah. yeah, the cabin itself, I mean, just out in the woods, no mm -hmm. electricity, mm -hmm. no running water, having to haul wood in out of the woods to mm -hmm. build a fire in a potbelly stove to try to keep warm at 20 below zero. Mm -hmm. All of that was incredibly, you know, you had, and the, we were snowed in all winter, so you skied in and out or mm -hmm. sledded in and out or trudged through 10 Jesus. feet of snow. And that it was just wonderful. It was also wonderful physically. God, I got so strong uh -huh. <laughs> it, it, up and down that mountain every day. So this is on a, on a manual typewriter. Yeah, it was you're, a little you're, Hermes. Oh, uh, uh -huh. Portable. Wasn't even a big one. <laughs> <from> portable. <laughs> Parts of it seemed to be written in a fever. Yeah, oh, it was. <laughs> oh, I, uh, well, I've always, I, uh -huh. I, write, I do most of my writing in a fever. Uh -huh. But I get up like at three or four in the morning and oh. I write for six or seven hours. Oh, uh-huh. And then, if I'm teaching, then I go teach. Uh -huh. And I'll take a nap in the afternoon. But uh -huh. I'm fortunately, I've always been able to get along on about four or five hours sleep. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. I love to write in the early morning. I love to be up in the early morning. Oh, uh -huh. It's a beautiful time of day, and the sun's coming up, and things are clean and crisp oh. and beautiful. Great. So writing, then, is just perfect. Oh, that's, that's a great story. <coughs> um, let me uh, skip ahead. So, so uh, then the, the move back to Delaware, how did that uh, happen? Well, when I got divorced, uh -huh. I assumed my kids would live with me because uh -huh. they were closer to me than they were to their mother. Uh -huh. and, I, and she didn't care to cut things short. It was much more complicated than this. They all decided they were going to go back to Santa Barbara. Uh -huh. Well, I just about went crazy, uh -huh. literally. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, really how ironic how things happen in uh -huh. life. The I got a telegram on, uh -huh. uh, they went home for Christmas. Uh -huh. I got a telegram on like the 1st of January and from my ex-wife saying, the kids have decided to stay. So for two days I was out of my mind. I didn't know what to do because I was on the verge of accepting a chair at the University College Cardiff in Wales in the uh -huh. law school, which uh -huh. I really wanted because it was really a, would be an exciting what place to be. Two days after the first of Jan, well, what had happened earlier was Delaware had called me in September uh -huh. and said, "Are you interested in a job?" And I said, "No." Uh -huh. And they said, "Well, you're our first choice for this job." So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and interview other people, and then maybe you'll change your mind. And two days later, Delaware called and said, well, we found another candidate we're interested in. Would you come for an interview? And I said, are you in America? And, <laughs> and the guy said, what? I said, I was kidding. I'm coming. <laughs> so I flew to Delaware. They offered me a job, and I took it. And the kids came and lived with me in, in uh -huh. Delaware. So uh -huh. it was clear that that was it. You know, uh -huh. The kids weren't going to be with me overseas. I wasn't going to be overseas. Uh -huh. So I was very close to them. Still am. Uh -huh. They're great people. Good. And, and so um, then begins uh, a period where you um, uh, become the, you start contemporary crises and right, uh, yeah. you, uh, the Law and State series, and mm -hmm. you, it seems this, you make a somewhat shift toward more editorializing. Yeah, is that, is that yeah, fair to say? Yeah, that's true. I hadn't uh, really thought of it that uh -huh. way because these things kind of just happen, you know. Yeah. They, asked me would I start a journal, yeah. uh, and I said, yeah, that, we need a journal, we need a critical journal, mm -hmm. but I don't want it to be just on crime, which mm -hmm. is what they wanted. I want it to be on more general issues of social problems. Crime mm -hmm. is certainly one of them with law, politics, and, mm -hmm. and they agreed, so we started Contemporary Crisis mm -hmm. that way. And then uh, I was asked to edit the, mm -hmm. or be co-editor of that series mm -hmm. that was uh, Academic Press, I yeah. think. So, I mean, it just kind of things happened that way, and I thought uh -huh. they were interesting and important to do, so I said, yeah, uh -huh. I'll do that. Um, so that was a shift. I uh -huh. haven't really seen it that way. <laughs> and and uh, 
Would you care to talk about, you've had so many great students over the oh years. Oh, boy. Have you, <laughs> you know, that have gone on to do great things. Would you care to just reflect just a bit about this? Well, I just, you know, I never cease to marvel uh -huh. at, the, at the quality of students, uh -huh. at both the graduate and undergraduate level. I mean, I know when I was in college, I don't think any of us had the kind of openness, energy, commitment, concern that the students I've had over the years have had. And of course, sometimes better than others. Yeah. And certainly the 60s was a highlight for me because these mm -hmm. were all people radically wanting to change the world. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but always I've had really good students. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I could mention a bunch of them. Uh, often some of my best friends have been my students. Mm -hmm. Kitty Calavita is certainly mm -hmm. one of my best friends and always will be. Mm -hmm. and a, brilliant student, I mean, you know, I'm sure you have the same experience. Yeah. I, I learn more from them than I can ever teach them. Sure. Uh, Linda Theo Magica, mm -hmm. Mike, uh, mm -hmm. David Keon, I could go through a list mm -hmm. of people I worked mm -hmm. with that are just wonderful people and mm -hmm. really good students. I, I don't mm -hmm. think, I don't think I've ever had a student. <laughs> I never had a student I didn't like. What is that mm -hmm. <laughs> expression I never saw? Mm -hmm. I, it's a, it's mm -hmm. really a privilege, I mm -hmm. swear. It's just so I never, I had, you know, I didn't come from a family that, I was the first one to go to college in my family, much mm -hmm. less go beyond it. In fact, after I got my master's and told my mother I was going to get a PhD, she said, why do you need another degree? You've got two of them. <laughs> <laughs> what do you need a third one for? Mm -hmm. um, I never even knew what it meant to be a college professor. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what it meant. Mm -hmm. I'd never been on a college campus until I walked mm -hmm. onto a campus to see about mm -hmm. going there. Uh, but I just fell into it, and yeah, I mean, I couldn't have done a better thing in my life. It, it's, uh, your teaching style has been described to me as uh, simply letting students know how one criminologist does his work. Uh, uh, is that nice. a fair assessment that's of? Nice. Well, I, I try to do a little more than that, <laughs> 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 but, but I do certainly do that uh -huh. to some uh -huh. extent. But I, what I try to do is to integrate myself into the work, but myself into other people's work as mm -hmm. well, so that I try to give them a kind of basic knowledge about what the field is like, mm -hmm. but it's mostly a critical appraisal of the field. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm quite critical of most theories, and I'm, so it does come out to be much more me mm -hmm. than other people. Mm -hmm. I think that might not be too good, actually. I probably should do less of that, mm -hmm. but I find it hard to, mm -hmm. because that's what excites me. And I think the most important thing in teaching, for me anyway, has been to excite the students. And I can only do that when I'm excited. Mm -hmm. and, if I, and I can tell it. You know, I get into describing some things that I'm not interested in, and they kind mm -hmm. of, I lose them that day or two days. Mm -hmm. And I go back to something that excites mm -hmm. me. It's, uh, it's mm -hmm. much more interesting. So now we're, we're back in the States. We're in Delaware. It's the late 1970s. Carter's in office, Watergate's over with, the divorce is gone. How do you feel? Is it, is it, are you feeling better about uh, the United, about America, Vietnam's over with? Are you more optimistic these, uh, in this period? Uh, no, actually, I think I, uh, it was during that period that I think I found my teaching was the most uh, problematic. Because the oh, students uh -huh. just didn't seem interested in it. They, uh -huh. were, they really didn't seem to care. Uh -huh. I couldn't seem to get them excited. And I had, I think, it was my fault because I had kind of lost contact with American students. I'd been uh -huh. in Europe for two years, and uh -huh. European students are very different. They're much more advanced and everything. So I had three or four years there where my teaching was kind of a burden, which had never been before and still isn't now, I'm glad uh -huh. to say. Uh -huh. But there were three or four years where I just dreaded to go to class because uh -huh. I just didn't seem to be able to connect with them. Uh -huh. And Kate Stout was one of my students then, and she connected beautifully with them. It made it even worse. I'd have her in to give a lecture, and she just did yeah. fabulously. The <laughs> students loved her. And they said, why doesn't she come tomorrow? And you go. Uh -huh. So I was, that was kind of a tough time for my teaching. Uh -huh. um, but then my research began to change, too. And I started to want to be more uh, empirical, I guess. I wanted to get, I wanted to f try to find data that would support some of the conclusions I'd come to on the basis of qualitative work, not in the sense of quant being quantitative, because I never would do yeah. that, but just find data that would show that this, these were not unique events. Mm -hmm. And I was also then very interested in the CIA and mm -hmm. the their involvement in crimes of all different types. So mm -hmm. I started working on that more mm -hmm. assiduously. Also uh -huh. started getting more dangerous. And that I got death threats and all kinds of things. And yeah. Well, we're gonna, let's get into that. Let's, <laughs> let's get into that. I, I see this is a, a sort of a, a, a shift uh, uh, 
uh, almost beginning uh, with uh, the election of Ronald Reagan to office, it might seem, the early 80s. Is uh -huh. this when your interest in, uh, in uh, CIA and smuggling and pirates yeah. and... Well, it had, it had, this has been continuing. Uh -huh. I, when I was, after I finished on the take, I realized that what I really needed to do was to understand the international yeah. organized crime. Uh, again, you know, not as a, some kind of monolithic yeah. <laughs> unit, but as different people doing criminal activities for profit. Mm -hmm. So that's when I went to Thailand for six months to mm -hmm. look into how do they get drugs out of Thailand right. and was the CIA involved in it, and I concluded they were. And then Al McCoy came out with his book before I wrote any of that up, and uh -huh. he had did a marvelous job of showing how that worked, and that's exactly what I had found. Uh -huh. So I never really wrote that up except to put it into some pieces here and there because he had done the job that needed to be done. Yeah. So yeah, then I was more and more interested in that, and I started trying to develop informants in the CIA, informants in the State Department, informants in the FBI, and to try to get together information that would somehow tie that together. This is not a safe job. <laughs> this was not there, a safe job. There are no. problems. This going. was this yeah. was uh, this was this was rather treacherous. I yeah. I am convinced actually that, uh, and I had started this before I went to Scandinavia. And I'm convinced that they send a hitman over to get me in Scandinavia. I have no way of knowing. He didn't yeah. kill me, so that's the only way I would have known if it was true. But there was a man on a, a trick. They call it a trick. It's this little train that is, uh -huh. goes in and out of the city. And there was a man on the trick who was l watching me. And it uh -huh. followed a time when two people had followed me to the cabin. Not all the way, because they didn't want to climb the mountain, but they'd driven their car up to where uh -huh. I started walking. And I confronted this guy, and I just looked him in the eye. I didn't say anything. And he looked at me, and then he got on the trick again the next day. He'd done on the trick like three days in a row. And this, this, this three, the second day, I looked at him, went up to him and looked him right in the eye. And he looked at me right in the eye. And then the third day, he got on the trick. And instead of getting off where I got off, which is what he'd been doing before, he, got on, he stayed on the trick after I got off. I have no way of knowing anything except I said to myself, he's not going to kill me. And then I never saw But he was clearly was following you. Yeah. Was he American? He was never heard him speak. Oh, okay. He, I, was yeah, the, yeah. I thought he was American. Uh -huh. He was one of the ugliest men I've ever seen in my life. I mean, mm -hmm. he had a, a head like a bowling ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a huge head. Mm -hmm. Big. Really scary looking guy. <laughs> and well, probably more scary in my memory than he was, in fact. Yeah. Uh, what I, my read of your work in, in this, the, uh, the state organized crime literature, I think one of the biggest contributions that you make the point is that when the state uh, wants to commit a crime, it has to go shopping for its criminals, yeah. more or less, because it doesn't. Right. These, these are bureaucrats. That's they don't so have important. the exper expertise so to commit the crime. Absolutely. Well, they, they might even have the expertise, but they're not willing to do they're it. Not, yeah. <laughs> they have families. They don't want to mm -hmm. go killing somebody. It might, mm -hmm. And they know, you know, I was with the counterintelligence corps in the Army in mm -hmm. Korea, and they told the first thing we learn is, if you get caught doing any of the things we tell you to do, we mm -hmm. have no connection with you. So they know that if they go out and kill someone mm -hmm. and somehow they get caught, that the CIA isn't going to say they were <coughs> working for the government. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, we don't know that guy. This is the norm of plausible deniability yeah. that we so, hear so much about. Yeah. So <coughs> what, uh, it's hard to get people to kill people. <laughs> yeah. The, it wasn't so for the pirates, though, was it? No. <laughs> no. Let's go back. That was part of their work. <laughs> what, what inspired you to look back at the pirates, uh, John Paul Jones? Where did you get that? You know, idea. Okay. I, I was in England. Uh -huh. Actually, the first two years at Delaware, I had a joint appointment in Cardiff at the law school, which mm -hmm. is where I was going to go, and I went half, spent half time there. So um, I was in England, and I've always loved historical work, mm -hmm. and I went to the British Museum, and there's a library there you can work in. And I went there mostly because that's where Marx wrote, and I just kind of mm -hmm. wanted to feel the vibes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and while I was there, I went into the documents room, mm -hmm. and they have the old documents in there. And I said, well, do you have anything on piracy? I don't know why. And they said, yeah, we do. And they started bringing me books that were old mm -hmm. documents. Some of them were handwritten by pirates, some by doctors, ship's doctors. They were some ship's laws. And I just thought, man, this is interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I didn't see it as connected with what I was doing, the research on the CIA. So I kind of was doing these two research projects. Of Mm -hmm. Pirates on the one hand, mm -hmm. smuggling, mm -hmm. CIA, organized crime, state crime, 
But I saw them as two different projects. And mm -hmm. then one day, I said, wait a minute. <laughs> That's the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm studying the same thing. And then mm -hmm. I realized this is, this is all part of state organized crime. And that mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. how I came to that, mm -hmm. write that paper. That's brilliant. And you uh, say you have plans for maybe a book on pirates? Is that oh, absolutely. If I, uh -huh. unless I die sooner. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, this is a lifetime project. I really, uh -huh. I still, I have a huge collection of books that I've got. Uh -huh. Old books, 16th, 17th century stuff. Let me, uh, let me d d jump ahead to uh, 1970, 1986, excuse me, and, and the move to uh, George Washington, uh, where yeah. you're at now. And uh, around this time, of course, uh, is the famous Iran-Contra uh, scandal. Coincidentally, uh, George Washington hires its most critical criminologist <laughs> in the face of this <laughs> historical development. Huh? <laughs> Why Washington? Uh, what, uh, well, actually, that was a personal reason. I was, uh -huh. had a relationship with a woman who uh -huh. was at Columbia University, and she could get a job in Washington, and she couldn't obviously get one in Newark, Delaware. Uh -huh. <laughs> and she was a lawyer. Uh -huh. And uh, so we were both moving to Washington oh, together. Uh -huh. now, as it turned out, we broke up before uh -huh. she ever got there. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so the move to Washington, which was predicated on, uh -huh. on uh, a relationship, the relationship uh -huh. ended, and I had, then I went to Washington. And anyway. you, went, uh, you, were, you were chair there for yeah, a while? Yeah, I was chair for it? three years. For yeah. three years, uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. um, the, the major piece, um, is uh, uh, during this time um, has, is the one that appears in the uh, British Journal of Law and Society uh, on making law. Yeah, is that, that, that was a fun, that was an interesting. Then I was yeah. in Cardiff. Oh, uh -huh. and, uh, and this guy brought me a paper of one of the Cardiff professors mm -hmm. to read that he had just written. Mm -hmm. Really good paper. Mm -hmm. I read this paper and I thought, you know, what this paper needs is a theory. Yeah. To, to make sense out of it. I yeah. mean, it was a really good description of how British regulated the classes and in the labor wars yeah. of the 1920s and 30s. And I thought, but it really needs an explanation. So I sat down and I started working on the theory. Now, I had written several papers before. Uh, the mm -hmm. first one was a request from Daniel Glazier for the Handbook of Criminology. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the paper on the state and the law, yeah. production of law or something. I've forgotten what I called it. And in that, I was struggling with trying to develop a theory and mm -hmm. basically was saying ruling class theory doesn't work. I mean, mm -hmm. you might like to have it work, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not true. It's false. So therefore, mm -hmm. and certainly functional theory is nonsense. Mm -hmm. I mean, so these theories, which, which we conventionally use, don't work. So what are the dynamics? Well, I was struggling with that back in the 60s and 70s when I was writing those papers on lawmaking. Mm -hmm. And so then I tried to reconceptualize and see what was it was doing. And then meanwhile, I'd read a lot of Marx, and mm -hmm. I'd read a lot of Gramsci, and I'd read a lot of, of uh, Giddens and other, especially European theorists. Mm -hmm. So then I said, I started working through it, and I thought, you know, well, this, this is how I think it works. So then I came up with that theory. Nice thing was that I gave the guy who'd given me his paper, and I said, what do you think of this? And, I th and he had written this great paper, and he said, that's what I wish I'd written. <laughs> so that, to me, that was a real fine uh -huh. compliment. Um, so that was what, uh -huh. that's how. W I was that, that the basis, uh, did that serve then for your coining, as far as I can tell, you coined the term state organized crime. Yeah. Am I right? Is yeah. That, was, that, was that the paper that sort of led into that then? Yeah, that was uh -huh. part of the whole process of mm -hmm. thinking through how, did, how are laws made and yeah. how the state's relationship to laws and the pirates and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these things, I, again, I, I, I like everybody. I mm -hmm. think everyone who does this kind of work, you do it. And you're not quite sure why you're doing it, and you hope it. But I mean, you know, we could have spent the hour talking about projects I started that n led to yeah. nothing as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't go anywhere. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so yeah. some of them work, some don't. Uh -huh. and you just keep. But uh, to but again, it, we mentioned pro uh, prophetic uh, half an hour ago with regard to Watergate. But again, is you came up with this theory at the same time Oliver North comes and begins to testify, yeah, uh, which, wh which also is then it comes in you, one of your first textbook, I believe, Exploring Criminology, uh -huh. wh is... Which really isn't a textbook. Well, <laughs> it, yeah, it's a point of view textbook, <laughs> perhaps. But uh, uh, that seemed, uh, it, I don't know, my perspective, uh, perception, but it seemed to uh, uh, 
sort of cast you in, in a different role now as sort of a, a spokesman for critical criminology, and a lot of people began to uh, replicate your work at some extent, and uh, several books followed uh, in that vein, readers and, and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you, during this time, you begin to get uh, awards from, uh, <laughs> you're the president of ASC and, and uh, uh, honored by the American so Sociological Association, a lifetime achievement. Seems like a, a very yeah. nice time. Right? <laughs> Wonderful is, is time, that, you know, yeah. yeah. Embarrassingly nice uh -huh. time. <laughs> uh -huh. No, really, I, I was, yeah, that was a very, very nice set of events. And uh -huh. you know, you, you know yourself, you yeah. work in isolation, you put the stuff out and you think, God, is anyone ever gonna read it or yeah. am I making a fool of myself? Yeah. And then you discover some people read it and they like you and say, yeah. that's good, that's important, that's helped me. And then you think, God, you know, that's, what yeah. more could you ask for? That's so yeah. wonderful yeah. that some people find it useful. Uh -huh. That's what you always hope for, uh -huh. but you never know. You uh -huh. know? On the other hand, of course, there are other people that write, this is the biggest bunch of garbage ever written. <laughs> <laughs> that's mm -hmm. the, that's mm -hmm. the academic world. Bill, in 1988, you uh, delivered your uh, uh, presidential address right here in this hotel before the ASC on state organized crime that w occurred on the 50th anniversary of the Nazi uh, Kristallnacht, if you'll that's remember, right, that, remember that, yeah. that night. It was a very moving speech. Some have talked about that speech and that meeting as sort of a, a signal uh, change in critical criminology that that may have brought new uh, researchers, new scholars into uh, into the field to study things from a critical perspective. Uh, has that been your sense of, is, in the last ten years now? Have you seen uh, <laughs> some new blood around that yeah. encourages you? You know, you never know you, how much, what difference it makes, whatever you did. But, mm -hmm. but I have been so gratified mm -hmm. to see so many people pursue avenues that I thought should be pursued on the basis of what I had done mm -hmm. when I scratched the surface of some of these things. Mm -hmm. So today at the ASC I went to a meeting mm -hmm. which was called a meeting on smuggling. A mm -hmm. section of it. But these people, there were six people there on the panel, mm -hmm. and they all are pursuing this line of research. They're mm -hmm. all looking at connections between the state mm -hmm. and policies and different types of organized crime, smuggling Chinese immigrants, smuggling uh, drugs, smuggling, money laundering, mm -hmm. smuggling equipment, smuggling drugs, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, guns and mm -hmm. things like this. Because what happens is when you get into, and this is exactly what I discovered, I mm -hmm. started out looking at narcotics and mm -hmm. drugs and how they got out of Southeast Asia and into the United States. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you do that, you realize you're not dealing with narcotics, you're dealing with the, the phenomenon of smuggling. Mm -hmm. And so what these people have picked up on is that the smuggling is what's going on. Mm -hmm. And some of it's drugs and some of it's guns and some of it's people and some of it's uh, money, but it's all being smuggled, mm -hmm. and including counterfeit money which mm -hmm. is being smuggled across the border. I mean, I think it's just incredible. I think mm -hmm. the body of information that's being developed on mm -hmm. organized crime generally. And when I started the study in Seattle in mm -hmm. the early 1960s, mm -hmm. I mean, the people on my faculty there said, don't, what are you wasting your time on organized crime for? There isn't any, what there is isn't important, and it's silly study. Mm -hmm. And since then, of course, it's become many, many studies have been done. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that they all emanated from my study, mm -hmm. but it's wonderful to see that when you start something and then people, other people pursue it, and then you really feel like, well, now we're getting a body of knowledge, which mm -hmm. I think we really are. So, and mm -hmm. I think the same thing is now happening mm -hmm. with state organized crime. I think, in fact, there's still a tendency to look at the criminals mm -hmm. rather than the symbiosis between the people who are, are engaged in the primary criminal acts, the people who are complicitous in it by helping them who are state officials. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that I hope to see and mm -hmm. I hope to encourage, however I can, more attention to the complicitous of state officials mm -hmm. in the organized crime business. But this then is really a, a very exciting, I think, what's happening in Good. criminology. Um, for the last f four or five years, you've been Augusta Scholar uh, at uh, Jerry Miller's uh, oh, National yeah. Center yeah. on uh, Institutions and Alternatives. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the war on drugs uh, since 1986. Well, this is also something I've gotten into doing research mm -hmm. on, and I, it's like I, I, the philosopher Dewey said, you know, research should, research should scratch where it itches. Obviously, drugs in the United States today really itches. Mm -hmm. So um, I was very interested in how police go about making arrests for drugs, 
why they have so many blacks compared to whites. Right. And then uh, that led me to all this business about, well, how many whites you actually use drugs compared to how many whites get arrested, yeah. how many blacks use compared to how many blacks get arrested. Yeah. And what are the policies in other countries, and yeah. the Netherlands especially, where we have the best data, yeah. but also some Scandinavian countries and yeah. Austria, they also have basically decriminalized it. Mm -hmm. So that, then, it, then the, in connection with that, then it occurred to me to ask the question, well, why, why has this become such a big issue? You mm -hmm. know, how has it happened that drugs became a big issue? Mm -hmm. Was this driven by the 60s, which was my first assumption, that mm -hmm. it was, you know, all the kids started smoking pot, and they mm -hmm turned on professors and they turned on some of their parents mm -hmm. and they were, is that then what caused this great concern over drugs? Mm -hmm. So I started looking f through public opinion polls to see, you know, what does it look like? And I was, I was astounded to discover that in fact mm -hmm. the public opinion didn't begin to reflect a real concern over drugs until they had been bombarding the public with how much danger there was in it from police and from politicians and from the media mm -hmm. for nearly 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And then the public begins saying, yeah, well, maybe there is a problem here. Mm -hmm. So it's clearly a problem that has been politically driven, a problem that's been driven by the media and by law enforcement agencies trying to build, buff up their budgets and, mm -hmm. and make themselves more important and mm -hmm. more powerful and mm -hmm. more independent of any kinds of external controls. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really uh, sociologically fascinating how organizationally mm -hmm. this whole problem has been created. Mm -hmm. And then the consequences of it are obvious. Mm -hmm. Uh, this research also led you to do some sort of ethnographic work with the Washington uh, SWAT team, is that right, right correct? Right. Uh, it's not the SWAT uh, team, but it's like that. So it's, it's called the Rapid Deployment Unit. Uh -huh. And it was created after the 1960s riots, with mm -hmm. the intention of being a unit ready to suppress riots in right. case they occurred. But uh, as I said in my paper, even in Washington, or even in the United States, we don't have riots that often. Yeah. So they had to do something else. And uh -huh. so they deploy these guys to go down into the ghetto they never go anyplace else. They mm -hmm. go down to the black ghetto and they look for young men mm -hmm. and they arrest, they stop them and if they mm -hmm. have any drugs on them, they arrest them. And that's how we end up with a prison population that's gone from 300,000 to a million and a half yeah. in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. And the immense cost of that. Mm -hmm. And they're almost all black people. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're certainly they're disproportionately black mm -hmm. people. What uh, do you see as a viable or meaningful research agenda for criminologists vis-a-vis -vis the war on drugs. What should we be doing? But I think <coughs> we need to do more comparative research. Mm -hmm. I think we need to have more data that will show that it's worked to decriminalize it in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. it's worked to decriminalize it in, de in Denmark, in Norway, in mm -hmm. Sweden, in Austria, in Spain. Mm -hmm. I think we need to get a massive amount of data because I think that will be the most convincing thing. Mm -hmm. Right now, and I've given some speeches on this to public groups, mm -hmm. and right now they say, yeah, but the Netherlands isn't the United States. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of easy to dismiss one case. In mm -hmm. a sense, it is one case where it has worked really well. Mm -hmm. So we need more data like that. Mm -hmm. But criminologists need to take a stand. The American Society of Criminology needs to say, mm -hmm. and the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences needs to make a public statement, as they have against death penalty, mm -hmm. against the war on drugs, and mm -hmm. say this is not working, yeah. we need to decriminalize drugs. Mm -hmm. So within our society, we need to work very hard mm -hmm. to get a policy statement mm -hmm. so that we can go to the politicians and say, you know, yeah. the major research organizations mm -hmm. studying crime in the United States have come out with this statement that we must decriminalize drugs. Mm -hmm. And then I think we also need to develop concrete policies mm -hmm. for what happens when you decriminalize them. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to, of course, separate decriminalization from legalization, but have policies where we say exactly what we think should be done. Mm -hmm. I have some ideas along those lines, but mm -hmm. it would be hard to build consensus. Mm -hmm. But I mean, clearly we can decriminalize mm -hmm. pot tomorrow, and mm -hmm. the pot smoking rate will probably go down somewhat, mm -hmm. but it won't change very much. This has always been an uphill st uh, struggle since Linda Smith yeah. in, the, in the 1930s and the battles yeah. with Ann Slinger. It's always been an uphill struggle with regard to drugs. Uh, it, it is if uh, public officials don't want to listen to the findings of this scientific community, whereas, you know, the, the AMA will listen to findings of medical researchers and endorse those. Mm -hmm. There seems to be this, uh, it, it will agree with you everything except when it comes to drugs, it's sort of well, uh, they, they don't agree with, with social sciences at all. Uh -huh. uh, so when we, and I was on the 
uh, Johnson's President's Commission on mm -hmm. Violence. Mm -hmm. And one of the findings of the study was mm -hmm. that countries that allowed pornography to be sold mm -hmm. had a reduction in the amount of violence connected with sex crimes where mm -hmm. pornography was somehow related to it. And when that finding came out, Nixon was by then president. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't agree with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I mean, it's like, and, and Clinton, you mm -hmm. know, jo Jocelyn Elders, when she mm -hmm. was Surgeon General, said, you know, we should look at other countries. Mm -hmm. And Clinton said, no way. Mm -hmm. Don't confuse me with facts. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know any. So you're dealing with, with ignorance, mm -hmm. ignorance on top of idiots, you know, mm -hmm. that, that they don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't care what the facts are. They mm -hmm. don't care what a good policy is. They care what is going to be politically expedient for mm -hmm. them. Law enforcement, on the other hand, mm -hmm. is uniformly all for this war on drugs. Mm -hmm. I mean, it gives them power. They sure. get to beat people up. They throw a lot of people in prison. And mm -hmm. They get more money and 100,000 mm -hmm. new police officers, and mm -hmm. everyone's afraid to ever criticize them. So, mm -hmm. you know, some cops beat somebody up and nothing happens to them. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just an aberration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it happens every day, everywhere, and mm -hmm. it's still. So it gives them an immense amount of power, this war on drugs. Mm -hmm. If you look at the data on arrests for gambling, for example, mm -hmm. you see that since the war on drugs has taken place, the arrest for gambling has gone down precipitously. Mm -hmm. The arrest for drugs has gone up. Mm -hmm. So there's, <laughs> when they didn't have drugs, they'd be arresting for something else. But mm -hmm. they couldn't be arresting nearly as many people for mm -hmm. shooting craps than they can for having mm -hmm. cocaine or marijuana. Mm -hmm. so. Lusaka, Zambia, has been rec described as one of the uh, most uh, desolate places in the world. Why, why did you choose that for your sabbatical <laughs> leave in 1989? I wanted to go to a socialist country uh -huh. uh, in Africa. Uh -huh. And uh, Kaunda had presumably been a socialist. And I realized that he hadn't been a very uh, systematically building socialism in Zambia. But he'd uh -huh. always espoused socialist principles along with Nereri. Uh -huh. And I had been to Tanzania before, uh -huh. 10 or 15 years before, and spent enough time there so I had a sense of what was going on there. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have really a sense of what was going on in Zambia. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to go to a socialist country in mm -hmm. Africa, and that was a natural one, and Kowanda was still in power, where Nereri was no longer in power. So it was mm -hmm. really between Tanzania and Zambia mm -hmm. once I decided to do that, because we could have gone to Southwest Africa, but at the time it wasn't clear what was going on in mm -hmm. Southwest Africa. So that's why I went there. Now, it mm -hmm. turned out that was totally wrong because mm -hmm. it was no more socialist than mm -hmm. Zaire mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, or Zimbabwe. And it's a desolate country mm -hmm. politically and mm -hmm. economically. It's one of the biggest tragedies. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, Africa is so full of tragedies. Yeah. It's yeah. The, uh, the consequences of colonialism for that uh -huh. nation, for that continent, are just incredible. But uh -huh. Zambia turned out to not be very interesting, uh -huh. except that I discovered that the socialist Kaunda was taking as many billion dollars out of the government as he could and put it in the Swiss bank account. Uh, so uh -huh. it was really discouraging in a sense mm -hmm. because it was no, it w I might as well have gone back to Nigeria, which uh -huh. we all know is what that's like, uh -huh. which, which is what it was like when I went there in 1969. Uh -huh. And Zambia turned out to be pretty much the same mm -hmm. place. It's smaller, there's less money, yeah. but it's, you know. 95% of the people living on starvation. But nevertheless, after Zambia is an explosion, yeah, I, I've count at least six books that, that appear between <laughs> 1988 and 1994, uh, three textbooks, Making <laughs> Law, the, a, a great edited uh, book, as well as Exploring Criminology, um, uh, reprints of, uh, I believe, of, of um, uh, on the take in several different languages. What's going on during this early to mid-90s uh, here? It seems well, you know, I'm one thing I've always done is every time I go overseas for a year, whether uh -huh. I'm working over there or not, uh -huh. I get an immense amount of energy to go uh -huh. to write and to, to, to work hard. Uh -huh. I, d I don't know why. I just get the feel you, you just feel so rejuvenated by uh -huh. the experience of totally different culture and different uh -huh. peoples and seeing things different. And it opens up things that are or hap that you've been trying to figure out. It mm -hmm. opens them up, they come clearer, at mm -hmm. least for me, that's always been the way. Mm -hmm. So I never have had any kind of schedule for writing. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never sat down and said, uh, you know, well, I want to write a book this year, I want to write yeah. a book next year. I've always just had projects I was working on, uh -huh. and they tend to come to fruition, and then, then they're done. But uh -huh. it's not a, it's, it's not, I never, and I usually work on two or three things at the same time, uh -huh. and I guess 
I guess what happened, though I had never even seen it that way, the way you <laughs> ever looked at it that way. Uh -huh. But uh, I guess what happened was that I uh -huh. had been working on a number of things for quite a while, and uh -huh. they all were kind of coming, coming at the same coming time. Coming at the same time. Let so me ask know. you a question about writing and influences from outside the orbit of criminology, uh, dating back from uh, your selection of friends, your doctoral dissertation up to the present. You've always made references to writers such as Eugene O'Neill, um, Kurt Vonnegut, and of course Mark Twain. <laughs> Mark Twain, yeah. yeah. Of course. Mark you want to talk a bit about these yeah, influences? Yeah. What I think, and especially in the early years of my education, this mm -hmm. was extremely important because I, I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know what that meant, you yeah. know, but I had this idea I wanted yeah. to be a writer. I also wanted to make a living, and I knew that being a writer and making a living might be incompatible with mm -hmm. one another. But um, so I did read a lot of literature. Mm -hmm. I spent one summer reading everything that Mark Twain, that I could, that I, not mm -hmm. everything he wrote, but a lot of Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I almost think I was put into a loony at bin because I would sit outside in California reading Mark Twain and laugh so hard that the mm -hmm. neighbors must have thought this guy's going completely off his rocker. Mm -hmm. And I think Mark Twain was a great sociologist. Mm -hmm. you know, his observations, especially in what is my favorite book of his, which is. Uh, not Huckleberry Finn or Tom mm -hmm. Sawyer, but mm -hmm. it's called Roughing It, mm -hmm. which is the story of his going west to work in Nevada with his brother who was a senator or something in that state. And he's a very, very keen observer, but he also is an extremely critical observer. I mean, he tries to see through things. He tries to see the underlying yeah. dimensions, the underlying tensions, the underlying processes, mm -hmm. as a sociologist would. Mm -hmm. as a, I would say a critical criminologist mm -hmm. would. And mm -hmm. so I just love Mark Twain. And mm -hmm. I find the same thing in Kurt Vonnegut's work, mm -hmm. in T.S. Eliot's poetry, the mm -hmm. same kind of thing. So I think these kind of, these were my early introductions to sociology and criminology, mm -hmm. were these writers who approached it. And among them, Lincoln Steffens, who was a mm -hmm. journalist from California who mm -hmm. wrote in the 1900s. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book on the shame of the cities, which he exposed. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of cute the way he exposed different types of corruption. He mm -hmm. said in Minnesota it's one thing yeah. and in Chicago it's another and in New York uh -huh. another. But basically he was just talking about how corrupt the cities were. Uh -huh. And that was very influential. Uh -huh. Again, sociologically it, it made me think in that kind of way before I actually started getting training in sociology. Uh -huh. So the, I, and I, also, I still read a lot of uh -huh. novelists. I think it's yeah. extremely important. Uh -huh. It's also important to learn to write. I mean, this is extremely, mm -hmm. I mean, as you know, you, mm -hmm. there are two ways to learn to write. One is to read people mm -hmm. who are writing, and the other one is to write yourself. Mm -hmm. But what, I've, what I had learned some time ago was when I'm reading people who are writing that I think are good writers, and I read something that is a difficult idea, mm -hmm. but I realize that they've expressed it clearly yeah. I go back and reread it several times to think, how did they get what their idea was on that paper that came to me the way they wanted it to come to me through that medium? What did they do with those words to do that? And I find this really, I love this. <laughs> you say you work uh, in the early morning hours. You do most of writing at home, do you? Yeah, uh, yeah. Do, do you? Oh, I, I don't think I've written anything yeah, but letters yeah. at the university, yeah. <laughs> ever. <laughs> no, I always uh -huh. work at home, and I get uh -huh. up usually at 3 or 4 in the morning, and I work uh -huh. for 4 or 5 hours. Depending on my schedule, I may work through the day, uh -huh. but then if I have classes, I'll work until 9 or so. And then uh -huh. Sometimes I take a nap in the afternoon, uh -huh. but I don't, I've never needed much sleep. 4 or 5 hours has always been plenty for me. Uh -huh. I find I'm needing a little bit more as I'm getting <laughs> older. <laughs> it's not well, quite as vigorous. Let, let me just, uh, sure. maybe two or three more. Wh uh, what's in the future? What are you uh, working going to turn to next? Well, that's a good question. I, I have three projects on my computer, mm -hmm. and I keep going back and forth, and I haven't been able to say, well, this is the one I'm going to complete. Uh -huh. well, one of them is a, 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 a scientific critique of criminology, especially mm -hmm. criminological theory, not mm -hmm. so much criminological method, in which I look at what philosophers of science say is how science works, how theory should be constructed. Mm -hmm. And then using that model that I think you can get from people like Kuhn and even Popper, but the whole history of the philosophy and logic of science, and then look at the criminological theory. Mm. And my goal there is really pretty simple. I want criminology to stop trying to be psychologists and develop a general theory of why some people commit crime and others don't which is a nonsense question. Mm -hmm. Since everyone commits crime, it's like asking why do some people die and other people don't. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody dies. Mm -hmm. The question is, what did they die from? And mm -hmm. You can then say, 
well, there are, everyone commits crime, mm -hmm. so why does these, this people commit crime or this person commit crime? But that's what psychologists mm -hmm. are supposed to do. We're mm -hmm. not supposed to do that. And go back to, ironically, what Merton said in mm -hmm. 1939, although mm -hmm. most people don't interpret Merton this way, mm -hmm. and when he said, well, we have to ask, how can we explain differences in crime rate? Mm -hmm. Now, that gets translated in criminology to saying, how did this person become criminal and tries to answer that question. But if you read the textbooks, they're all saying Merton's theory is that people will innovate. Merton's not saying that at all. Merton's saying that where you have this disjunction, mm -hmm. the crime rates will be higher mm -hmm. than where you don't have it. And the, presumably the degree of the disjunction will increase and the groups that have the greatest disjunction will have the greatest deviance. That's what he's, he's not talking about individuals. Mm -hmm. But I really want to get criminology off of that kick. Because I think if we could, get all that energy into doing sociological analysis of crime mm -hmm. and away from psychology of crime, we'd really be able to get a lot mm -hmm. more progress in the field, mm -hmm. learn more faster. So that's one project. The other one is a project which is for the general, general audience. I'd like to write a small book that talks about misperceptions of crime. Mm -hmm. you know, the most fundamental one being that the crime rate is going up astronomically, mm -hmm. that we're all in grave danger or graver danger than we ever were before, and mm -hmm. just show that you know nothing much has changed for 50 years in terms of crime. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more violent than it used to be, but then there are more guns on the street. Just give kind of a sensible mm -hmm. criminological interpretation for the general public. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is a book that is uh, for crimes of the state. It's to take the state organized crime paper and then look at gun smuggling, smuggling nuclear weapons, smuggling as well as drugs, of course, mm -hmm. smuggling people in and out of countries, because clearly some countries are actually supporting the smuggling of their people into the United States because they want to get rid of the people mm -hmm. and they can't mm -hmm. support. So I'd like to do that. And then, you know, the Salinas stuff in Mexico and mm -hmm. try to bring state organized crime materials together into a book. So mm -hmm. Those are the three things, but I'm not so sure which one I will ever finish, if any. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right. It doesn't sound like you, you're not working with, uh, with a gun to your head these days. You're, no. you're at your own pace. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That is nice. Yeah. I play uh, tennis now. I never did before. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, a couple other things. Uh, back to Lindy. What, what, what would he think of modern-day criminology? What I think he would, uh, he would probably think very much what he thought when he was alive. Uh -huh. I don't think he would see much progress. I think uh -huh. he would see some people that were doing things. I think he's very proud of the work like John Gallagher has done yes. that's uh -huh. carried on the tradition of mm -hmm. studying drugs mm -hmm. and pretty much the way Lindy did, wanted mm -hmm. to see it done. Mm -hmm. So I think he'd be very proud of some of his students that mm -hmm. have carried on his tradition. And mm -hmm. the influence he's had, I think, would, would just thrill him. And I don't think he yeah. ever knew how much of an influence he would have mm -hmm. because he kind of he got very sick and he got, didn't really know mm -hmm. what was going on the last mm -hmm. 10 years or so of his life. Mm -hmm. And that's when his impact was being shown the yes. greatest. Yes. Um, and you know, the Linda Smith Center in New York, yeah. I mean, he would just be so, I'm so sorry he didn't live long enough to see those to things. See things. Yeah. But generally, as far as crime is concerned, I think he would think, you know, these guys are doing these numbers crunching. This is nonsense. What are they? This is crazy. This mm -hmm. makes no sense. And he mm -hmm. would think, and these theories of why people commit crime, you know, mm -hmm. Travis Hershey's stuff mm -hmm. and all. This is, what is this craziness? Mm -hmm. And that's what he thought then. Mm -hmm. He would still think it now. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. though I think that that's mostly, I don't think mm -hmm. he would see much change. I think he would be glad to see a lot of mm -hmm. political movement against the way we're dealing with drugs. On the other hand, he mm -hmm. would be incredibly upset that the criminologists haven't done more to stop that process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think he would, be upset by the racial disparities mm -hmm. that we're all upset about mm -hmm. in terms of the enforcement of law. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, I think it's on balance he probably <laughs> would feel pretty much like he did in the 1960s. Uh, in last night's uh, uh, speech, uh, presidential address, Charles Wolford uh, had one part of his uh, uh, delivery where he says, Tony Platt, where are you? Uh, and and, and it, was, it was sort of uh, a statement of thank you to critical criminologists for directing attention toward justice. Uh -huh. We've always done well in explaining crime. Mm -hmm. Some would argue about that, but it was it was uh, there's been this silence in criminology with regard to justice. Uh -huh. But and and that seemed to me to be some sort of uh, mainstream statement about the need to turn to issues of justice. Uh -huh. Do you do you see uh, sort of uh, are you encouraged? Uh, by movements in that uh, direction? Uh, encouraged and discouraged. I uh -huh. mean, so much of the 
attempt to look at justice this looks at it from the point of view of the National Institute of Justice which yeah. has the money to fund the project yeah. and so a lot of the studies are up the effects of boot camp I mean yeah. it's, it's encouraging because they always come up the same way the boot camps are not effective they're rather cruel but they don't do yeah. any good so in that way those studies that they think are going to support their ideology don't support it so uh -huh. in that sense it's kind of a good thing uh -huh. but the money is just so poorly spent no I, I think I'm very I think that I think the world is in an extremely dangerous place mm -hmm. and it's in a very dangerous place in terms of the immense amount of illegality of people in major political positions in states in mm -hmm. nation states and the tremendous illegality of business people in the international market mm -hmm. evading taxes so that nation states are actually losing their tax base mm -hmm. has been declining in every major western industrial state mm -hmm. and they're trying to make up for it by putting consumer taxes out there to make up for it but these are huge problems they mm -hmm. are the problems of crime in the modern world mm -hmm. but all the focus is taken away by letting them define black people as potential criminals and super predators right. and criminologists are playing into that hook line and sinker mm -hmm. and I think it's horrible I mean mm -hmm. I think it is reckless mm -hmm. it's irresponsible mm -hmm. and it's irresponsible of politicians to do it it's irresponsible of criminologists to not be fighting it mm -hmm. I don't hear anything at these meetings about the the lies that people like Fox and DiUlio are saying mm -hmm. where they simply are making up data mm -hmm. and and they and clearly they know it I mean they mm -hmm. can't possibly be so stupid that they don't know it mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. no I'm <laughs> afraid you hit a sore point <laughs> I get oh that's fine very yeah. agitated about uh -huh. I think criminology is going in the wrong direction except there is the group of people mm -hmm. the critical criminologists mm -hmm. generally and then some others who mm -hmm. are not necessarily critical Mm -hmm. like Roland Shilton who mm -hmm. does wonderful work by saying well I don't have I'm not a critical criminologist but I'm going to look at the data these are questions that yes. need to be asked and that's encouraging and mm -hmm. I, I agree you know mm -hmm. the fact that this meeting was titled um, towards an understanding of crime and justice, justice or something. Yeah, yeah. what I would like to have seen would have been said uh, crime and justice uh, is this a contradiction uh -huh. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. or cr criminal policy and justice is this a contradiction because uh -huh. I think basically it is I uh -huh. think it's the old Camus contradiction between uh, justice and equality. Yeah. yeah. And you, you can't have both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you foresee, a, uh, in this war on drugs, do you s foresee us or the state reaching some sort of critical mass where they're just going to say enough prisons mm -hmm. and so. retreat a bit on this Ironically, search that's, and destroy? That's, that's, I mean, it's kind of sad mm -hmm. when the only hope we have that this is really going to change is it's going to become so expensive. Yeah and take so much money away from education and from all the other things, from the infrastructure, from mm -hmm. the highways, that they're going to say, we yeah. just can't afford to put these people in prison anymore. Yeah. And that's sad to think that the only way a humane and scientifically defensible social policy is going to come about vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. drugs mm -hmm. is that the state just decides they don't want to put that much more money into putting people in prison. That's tragic. But I think it probably will come to that. Let me uh, conclude with uh, sort of a personal question. What advice do you have for those coming up behind a uh, uh, younger criminologist about how to put this all into perspective, the, the one's commitment to writing and passion to uh, progressive social policies with the need for family and the need for one's uh, own sort of humanistic and spiritual well-being? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I don't think it's a balance that I, that I managed very well. So. Perhaps I'm not a good person to ask that question to. I, mean, uh -huh. I think you probably are a better person to ask that oh. question to. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I could only say uh, this is the challenge of life. Uh -huh. It's how do you, how do you, how do you mediate, moderate your passions uh -huh. with being a humanist, with doing things that you think are important for your family, yeah. for yourself, uh -huh. for other people on a very one-to-one -one basis, uh -huh. and how do you? deal with that conflict which is inevitable if you have passionate interests in something else like writing or research. Mm -hmm. um, I've been fortunate in, in having people around me who were very mm -hmm. supportive mm -hmm. and I've also been fortunate in being able to work pretty fast mm -hmm. and, and where a lot of people struggle much more harder mm -hmm. to do the writing than I do. Mm -hmm. But it's not an easy, mm -hmm. not an easy task, yeah. and I and I don't think I handle it very well. I mean, uh -huh. I think I wouldn't have gotten a divorce if I'd handled it better. And, uh -huh. uh, 
And I think there's, I don't have an answer he, to it. It he, just had no. I guess the only answer for me is that to be aware yeah. that this is one of your life struggles. Yeah. And to yeah. try to deal with it as well as you can and with mm -hmm. as much decency and sensitivity mm -hmm. as you can. Uh -huh. And probably yeah. also accept the fact that you're going to fail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're not going to yeah. be able to balance all of these different yeah. things. Uh, Cressy even made this statement once formally that, that being a criminologist meant uh, you send those kids away for six or seven years while you write to get your tenure and write to get your feet on the ground, sort yeah, of well, so that break, that. you know. So, um, I don't accept that at all. Well, <laughs> 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 um, uh, okay, well, I guess uh, that's, uh, oh, the, one other thing, one other thing. The, it, you mentioned the word struggle, and it is a struggle a lot. Right. I, I guess the, the final thing I would be, is, is do you have any advice for those of us who are struggling and trying to, to carry on this tradition to keep the fire going, to keep the struggle uh, afloat? I don't think there's a problem if uh -huh. you stay close to the data. You, know, you stay close to the people. You uh -huh. get out there, mm -hmm. and you're going to have the passion because it uh -huh. comes from them. It doesn't come from you. Yeah. And if you're there looking at what's going on, having your eyes open, being open-minded and sensitive, you're going to have the passion to do it. Uh -huh. The problem is to get out on the street, yeah. to stay out of your offices. I, I wrote a long time ago that mm -hmm. uh, John Gallagher and someone wrote an article about why don't we have any much research on organized crime. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the article, I said, the problem isn't that the data aren't there. The mm -hmm. data are there. The sociologists aren't there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think that that's, that's really the point. Get out, find out, as you've done in your work. I mm -hmm. mean, you go. Mm -hmm. Talk to a bunch of Marlitos mm -hmm. in prison, and you're mm -hmm. going to have the passion. You talk yeah. to skinheads, and you're going to see yeah. things you have to get out. Exactly, it becomes yeah. something you have to do. Uh -huh. This is this is this is the way it, life is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. Is that, is well, that thank, you that, thank you very much. Thank you. It was very nice. <laughs>